today about financing burnout on the Mike Rosehart Show. Welcome back to, I don't know, this is episode like 65 or something. I don't even know what episode we're on now, but we've been doing this for well over a year now. Well over, maybe even close to a year and a half now. See you, Kyle. Um, this is going to be a quick one. I'm feeling burnout today. So I thought I'd do a video on financing 101. So how do you finance a business? How do you finance the purchase of real estate? How do you finance whatever it is you're trying to borrow money for? Financing can come from your own cash reserves, can come from borrowing money from other people, can come from, and that could be in the form of a lender bank financing, it could come from not a lender financing, for instance, like loan sharks. There are a whole gamut and range of financing alternatives and options, but let's say a good deal falls in your lap. I've been known to say that if you find the deal, if you have the deal, the money will come. And that isn't necessarily totally true. I might have been, just a fibbin just a little bit because good deals have fallen in my lap as of recent and no one's jumping so ne not necessarily does money come it's your ability to market that deal and communicate that the deal is good as well as jump through the hoops to obtain financing so if you want cheap financing what do you have to do slip too loud and move this back there is that better someone tell me this is still work on youtube Hey guys, Tommy, Gertie, William, good to see you guys on. Um, I gotta look nice and loud, so hopefully it's not too loud. If it is, I can adjust it down just a tad, see if that's better. Um, okay, so we're talking about financing and how do you finance building purchases, like real estate, buying properties, how do you finance businesses? I'm going through burnout right now and make this episode quick because I am exhausted. Trying to do everything that I'm doing, I'm wearing too many hats and doing too much with two young children at home, a three-year-old and a newborn. So I want to talk about financing burnout. Even if you're a single individual with 12 hours a day, financing burnout can creep in. Imagine you're buying a property or two and the A lender banks say no. By the time you've got to that point, you've likely applied to TD, BMO, you know, the major big banks, and you've had to submit all of, so what goes into a lending package? Well, one, you're going to have to explain the whole narrative of the deal is going to take you probably two, three hours to document all that, send all that and then your, your plan effectively for the building. Then you're going to have to send in every property lease for every property you own. And if you have 10 or 20 buildings, that lending package is going to be at least a hundred pages. You got to get it all together and it can't be old stuff. You have to update it. I go in and find out like six of my leases are expired. So now I have to go meet the tenant, get them to sign tenant acknowledgements to prove they still rent for me. Oh, 90 days bank account showing the rents going in, highlighting each and everything. There's a whole evening just doing that. Uh, then you're going to have to get your mortgage statements to show your current balances on all your properties. You have to show the interest rates and the mortgage payments that you're paying, your property tax bills for each and every property, probably lost. You have to try to find those and dig them up. Most recent property taxes. Uh, insurance shows active valid insurance on the property. Send that off to the financier. And then, of course, you're going to have to send them any other additional documentation that they want, such as pay stubs, showing uh, investment accounts, basically a full nude of everything about your personal self from your notice of assessments on your tax returns for the last two or three years to the financials on any businesses that you're invested in. And the bigger your portfolio is, the more work this is. This process is very tedious and very tiring. People make it sound easy. It is not easy. It is hard. You will spend a lot of hours. When you buy a property, it's more work to finance the property than it is to find the deal in most cases, especially once you get plus 10 properties. Once your portfolio is large, or you don't have two years of company financials and you're an entrepreneur, or your income is not sufficient, you have to move into B and C lenders. Now, the nice thing is, as you move out, it's easier to get financing, right? It's, you can reach out and they want less. They may just pull your credit score, maybe show you have 20% down payment, and some proof of income, and maybe some rough stuff on your properties, like an impact report showing the rough value of the property, and some taxes and other documents like that. So that package could maybe take you one or two nights. But still, imagine if you were closing 10 properties. You would need someone full-time just to help finance these properties. And since I close a lot of volume, I can tell you that financing burnout is real and closing businesses is difficult too. At the last hour, a financier will always pull, right? Like two out of 10 times, one out of five times, you're gonna have the financier pull for whatever reason. I'm buying a business right now, it's closing in a couple of weeks, and my A lender, Bank of Montreal, wants big four stamp on the financial statements. That takes 60 to 90 days, closing in two weeks. They are totally fine for the last three months. We've had all the, the letters of intent and everything and all gotten to this point and it falls apart. This is the real life. This is right now I'm closing a three and a half million dollar business 
and we don't have the funds. We're short, say, around a little over a million bucks. So now we got a problem. Now I have to reach out and try to find private financing. That's the real world. Can you scrape together 1.4 million to save a deal that's, you know, there's so much profit here that it would be worth it to pay 10, 12, 15, 18% interest even to save the deal. Now it's wild because that requires a lot of work. And so I think that people don't understand when they get into these, these ventures, they buy properties, they're buying businesses, they think, oh, I'll just get approval, it'll be good to go. My recommendation is this, guys. If you're buying a property, have two lenders lined up and fully approved. Two, very important. One will pull. In 2016, thinking back three years ago, I had Scotiabank pull on a deal because they got a sniff that it might be in a student rental area. It wasn't even a student rental, but at the last minute, came out as potentially a student rental area. This was far back from the campus. It was like close to downtown, it made no sense. But they just got a whiff of it. I guess someone in their underwriting department said, hey, that area is a student rental. There was nothing in the description of the listing, but at the last minute, we're talking days from funding, they pulled. Thankfully, I had a backup A lender that came to the table and I had already taken them almost all the way and they were competing on rates. So they were able to jump on it and close. But just be careful guys when you're buying real estate. If you don't have the cash to back it up, you could lose your deposit. And what if you can't negotiate with the seller to potentially extend closing? In most cases where that's happened to me, I've been able to bribe them for say you know, $1,000 we extend closing a week or two. Most sellers are reasonable and they will if they're compensated give you an extension on closing. Sometimes though, they're very hard with this business. I'm having a very hard time extending closing. The cost to do that is so high that it makes sense to pay a higher interest rate to get the business closed. This brings me to my final point. When you're, oh, I'm gonna make a plug. This weekend, it's Saturday, I'm speaking at Matt McKeever of Jeff Weibo's Mas what is it? Uh, Raising Capital Mastermind, I think is the name of it. I probably butchered the name of it, but it's a mastermind on how to raise capital. And I'm gonna be talking there about some of the strategies I've used to raise you know, 10 figures, sorry, eight figures in capital in 10 months. And I wanna talk about some of the strategies I've used to get A lender financing and then how I've worked with investors to help coach them through getting their A lender financing and as well using some B and C lender um, financing. But the biggest thing I wanna speak about is you get to a certain point and it's hard to do this in the beginning, but you wanna move up the evolution where in the beginning you might work with an A lender and it's really, really, easy because you only have a couple of properties, the documentation required is not that much, it's mostly on your job income. But as your portfolio grows, it becomes so time consuming. And if, imagine if my times were three, four hundred dollars an hour. If I'm spending 20 hours or 30 hours to get financing, that's six, eight thousand, ten thousand dollars worth of my time. I could find another deal in that time. It's actually, if you run the numbers, cheaper for me to go pay a B lender a five thousand dollar lending fee to waive all that crap and get me approved at six or eight percent financing short term on say a flip project and then refinance down the line after I've renovated it and unlocked the value. So I'm, I'm still gonna refinance it at that A lender rate, but in the beginning to get the deals closed, it can sometimes make more sense to go outside that realm. And for a long time I was closed, I had blinders and thought, hey, A lender financing is the most important way to go. I don't care about how much time it costs. It makes more sense to do it that way. Um, I really just feel like it's a, it's a tough one. As you start your journey, you'll take any, any JV partner or any investor you can find, right? It makes a lot of sense, or any lender you can find, right? Someone who will send you the capital to close on the deal. But as you get bigger and it gets more complicated, what you want to find, I'm gonna talk about this, is how you get your whales. Your whales are people that have a million dollars in cash. They're the guy that you've done three, four, five deals with. They trust you, you've built a relationship, you've made them lots of money, and when a deal comes in, you call them and it's done. That's where you wanna eventually get to as a business buyer, or as a real estate investor, that's the ultimate. And I think even if you're going for a lender financing, you should always have those people in your back pocket. So I'm gonna talk this weekend about some strategies to build those people up and, uh, or sorry, uncover those people and then build the relationship up with those people. Sorry, exhausted, forgive my rant. There are questions here that I want to answer, so let's jump into some questions real quick and then I'll jump back into talking about how to finance businesses and properties and then I hope there's a lot of questions that get me into some of the nitty gritty of it. But Okay, so off topic of financing, I was wondering if you had any tips dealing with bed bugs, rats, mice, and properties, if you've come across them, of course. <laughs> yes, I've come across all of those before, each and every one of those multiple times. Um, I could have a whole sidebar conversation on that, and let's park that. My thought is that they're all treatable, and you can heat treat bed bugs and things like that. Call a local pest control um, operator. You can do a lot of it yourself. There are DIY strategies you can go Google about. For instance, like bed bug covers on beds is huge. The mattresses don't get infected. Anyway, I'll sidebar that, but yeah, there is, you can definitely do some Googling, 
to tackle that stuff yourself. I've come across it. It's a it's just part of being a landlord. You know, when you have 100 tenants, one in 100 tenants are going to have that issue. Okay, so uh, my poor kid's suffering a year. Wondering to approach for scenarios. Yeah, exactly. So it's very expensive um, to deal with uh, bed bugs. Definitely a challenge, I think. Um, the problem is this, right? With bed bugs, oh, my phone's going to die here. The problem with bed bugs, Tommy, to, to help like remove them from your unit. So if you've got a rental property with the uh, bed bugs, there are strategies you can use, like there's diametris, like earth you can put down. The problem is with bed bugs is almost always they either come in the building from the, te they always come from the tenants. It's the tenant's fault. I wish there was rules right now that, around bed bugs that you could charge the tenant right now it's you can split it with the tenant you can if you do one treatment then the next treatment you can build to the tenant as long as the landlord show that they've tried to remediate the problem i've been having in some of my um we have a couple of like international student houses and they bring roaches in and things like that in their rice and as a landlord it's tough guys um it, it's a constant battle it's a tenant problem not a building problem like the bed bugs just come out of nowhere they come, like the tenants go places, they go visit friends who have bed bugs, they bring them back. Um, they don't come out of nowhere, the tenant brings them in. So it's 100% a tenant problem. Um, it becomes a landlord problem when the tenant complains, and then you have to kind of work together to solve the problem. The, the challenge, like my in-laws actually own a pest control company, so I've been <laughs> well in touch with a lot of these issues. And it is honestly like wealthier, your, your, a, your A units, where you have like really high quality tenants, this is like my ideal, I like to target the A, a units, so I'd recommend if you're a landlord, fix your property up, make it nice, and put in great tenants. Because wealthier tenants, like one of my wealthy tenants, came back from vacation and had bed bugs in their suitcase. They were immediately instantly. They were too embarrassed to even let me know. It's only the tenants who are very, um, I don't want to say dirty, but like the tenants who can't keep up with things, whom can't can't kind of address the issue. That's kind of a challenge. Um, I don't know who this dirty person is. Um, Justin says, hey Mike, do you use a broker or find the mortgage yourself? So yeah, we use, we've used brokers and we've used A lenders. It's, it's key, I think, to focus on what is the, gonna be the most cost effective versus your time. So if your time is very valuable, and uh, it, this is maybe a tenant I see jumping on here, um, you'd reach out to our property manager and you can like hit up that or I'll just like block you. Uh, I don't have, I, I don't manage any of the buildings myself, so if a tenant's jumped on my social media, Definitely uh, hit up, I think if you're one of the tenants that we just, one of the buildings we bought, so you're an inherited tenant, have, have a talk with, uh, with our property management division and they'll, they'll help me sort it out and get it, get it treated. Cool. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, do you use a broker or do you use a A lender? So going through an A lender directly will often save you on the rates. Typically, I found going through a mobile specialist at an A lender bank what you'll find is you'll get a little bit of a rate discount versus a broker. I found the brokers can't quite get the same terms, specifically with Scotiabank. A lot of the brokers think they can get the same sort of terms, but I've been going directly through a mobile agent and getting much more favorable rates from and terms from going directly to the bank. So I've always preferred going direct to the bank as opposed to going to a broker. But I've used lots of business brokers on the business side when you're buying a business, or when you're buying a rental property, and you don't have that relationship with an A lender bank, the broker can shop that out to six, seven, eight lenders at once and get you the best rate and the best terms. So it can make sense. On the business side, you'll pay a one or 2% lender fee. On the real estate side for a B or C lender, often the, the B or C private lender won't compensate the broker, so the broker has to charge you a fee as the borrower. And so then you're going to have to pay a one or 2% of the loan amount fee. So let's say you're borrowing $200,000 mortgage, expect to pay a two or $4,000 fee for that that said though, if they're gonna put the business case together for you and get you that financing to close the deal, it can still be worth it in many situations where you won't qualify for a lender financing or where maybe you don't have the time. Like I have a property closing July 31st right now, it's a flip opportunity. Most of my investors aren't interested in flips. It's a new kind of starting a flipping arm and it's something that like, it's out of London, it's, you know, it's a little bit further away. And it's one of those properties where you need cash to close, a mortgage can't be found. And so in that situation, I'll probably have to pay 10 or 12%, maybe even 1% lender fee to get this closed in under two weeks. And a lender would require an appraisal and they'll wait two or three weeks for an underwriter decision. You just can't get it closed that quickly. So if you wanna close really quickly and you can get a good deal on the property for that, let's say you could negotiate 10 or 20 or 30% off the purchase price for closing in like 
10 days cash offer, it makes sense to go to a broker who then knows a private lender, likely they know some, some whale type investors with a few million bucks to invest, and they basically syndicate the mortgage for you. They put it together for you. And you get to close quickly, and you don't have to worry at all about, uh, yeah, you, just, you don't really have to worry about a lot of the, the negative side effects associated with all of the, like the putting together the deal and grabbing all of the, the paperwork and, and then potentially not even being able to close with that A lender financing that would come through at the end of the day. At least the B or C lender will come through no matter what. Okay. So next question, if you had gone to law school, would you have followed a similar path? Do you think it would have worked with your time? So William, yeah, I actually wrote my LSATs and thought about going to law school. Um, I'm glad I didn't. I think people go to school for too long and it makes a lot of sense to get into the workforce as soon as you possibly can. There's the concept of opportunity cost. So opportunity cost simply states that when you do one thing, you cannot do another. If you sit at home watching TV, you can't therefore be out earning money. You can be in law school paying money and earning nothing and you will forego the earning opportunity of those years of law school as well as the interest gained on that money you could have saved. So let's think through this. If I'd gone to law school, it would have been an extra three years after my IB education. It would have cost me probably 50, now I would say about 70000 $80,000. And I could have been making $60,000 a year for three years. So my opportunity cost is the cost of the education plus the money I could have made and saved and invested. So I've been out about 150,000 in savings I could have had for those three years. And I'd be out of 70, 80,000 in tuition. So I would be starting at negative 220,000 opportunity cost. Now that's compounded at a rate of seven to 10%. So over my lifetime, the cost of that law degree, by the time I'm 65 is about three to $4 million. The amount of extra income you need to earn after you graduate law school needs to be proportional to that. I've run it in Excel. Basically, if you're a lawyer and you can make $180,000 a year, it's worth it to not go to law school. It's better actually graduate high school, go into the trades and make 60, 70 grand a year, 50, 60, 70 grand a year by the time you're 24, 25, because you've been in the trades, say, seven years at that point. It makes way more sense. You'd be way better off than the guy who's making $180,000 a year, but way to start working at 24. Because the value of a dollar today saved and invested is worth way more than a dollar later, right? So yeah, uh, no regrets. Definitely didn't go to law school and glad I didn't. Went to Richard Ivey School of Business and it's a toss up whether or not it's worth the extra money to go to an elite business school. I think for me, it built my network a bit and taught me some skills I wouldn't have otherwise. And let's be honest, I'm gonna rationalize it because I went through it and I did it and it went well. Um, but I think for each person it kind of is, a, is what is gonna be a good fit and what is the opportunity cost of your time. So I think honestly, the sooner you can get into the workforce and start making money, this more financially wealthy you'll be. So if it's a financial decision, it probably doesn't make sense to delay going to school. Uh, someone says, hey, I'm pretty sure you would have continued exactly as you are if you're in law school. So I don't think you would have lost anything. Yeah, there you go. So maybe I would have made, you know, I made 50, 55, and then 60 grand a year at my job in consulting after I graduated from, from Ivy. And uh, I probably would have made maybe 70, 75, 80 as a lawyer. So the difference in of tax is a couple of thousand. One real estate deal made the difference. And the thing is the time value of that money, right? That three years, I would have not even, I wouldn't have retired until I was almost 30 if I had gone to law school. And so it was a, you know, he didn't do it. He could have didn't. Yeah, so Robin, good good point jumping in there. I appreciate the, the question on that. Yeah, it's, it's a choice at the end of the day. And I think that for most people, it should make sense financially to not be in post-secondary school. If you can start right at 18, and I graduated high school at 17. So 17, if I went into the trades, I'd be wealthier today than if I had gone, I went to Western and got a business degree and went to Ivy. That was actually a financial mistake. It's a lot smarter to start working right away. If you could embrace frugality and learn how to live on, like I live on about, I don't know, when we were single, we were living on like nine, $10,000 a year. So I found ways to rent, hack, and house hack to keep my costs really low. And I was super frugal. So if I had embraced that as, and done a trades job, I'd be probably a master plumber, master electrician, something like that in, a, in the trade, making probably more than I made at Infotech and had retired maybe even a year or so sooner. And it would have lent itself better to real estate investing. So people ask me if I could do it again, probably would go into the trades. 
uh, would have made more money. I ended up working on my properties kind of in the trades before I've elevated. Now, thank God I don't have to swing a hammer. I have people that all do all the renovation stuff and maintenance and the property management. I'm so thankful because I actually hate that. But now that I've elevated to a point where I can put together deals and do the higher level stuff, I hate doing all that stuff. Like the last thing I want to do is have a tenant call me. It just drag you down to their, their problems. You gotta have a, someone, I think as a real estate investor, you gotta put up a shield. You either have to have tough skin to be able to handle all the, the BS or you put someone in there as an intermediary to deal with those things for you because it is a tough job. It's one of the hardest jobs I think that exists is being a landlord. The pay is bad and there's, it's very, very tough um, to intermediate. So definitely something to, uh, to think on. Okay, let's see here. I'm gonna ignore. Would you ever use your TFSA as a down payment for a rental? Yeah, so you can keep your down, your tax-free savings account as a place to invest capital tax-free. That's what the tax-free savings account is. It's a place you can invest your money and invest it tax-free. It's nice, it's, it's great. You can say you grow your, your TFSA, invest it in stocks within your tax-free savings account and it grows 10%, boom, awesome. Um, then all you need to do is simply, you don't, have to, you don't have to file anything on the tax return because it's a, it's a gain your tax-free savings account so you don't have to pay any tax on that. That's the win in the tax-free savings account. That's it. Other than that, it's the same as a savings account. Um, so it's like saying if you, have, if you had 20000 in cash sitting in a savings account, it's the same thing as saying a tax-free savings account effectively. Um, yeah, you use that for a down payment. For sure you could. Um, would I use it? Yeah, if you had enough for a down payment, I would, I would use it for a down payment for sure. I think that um, it depends on your goals, right? Like some people find they do better investing in stocks. Other people find with leverage that they get better returns in real estate. I personally gravitate towards real estate because I like the leverage. I like to be able to borrow up to my eyeballs at a really cheap interest rate and then put that money to work at a higher rate of return and then get the difference. So that's, you take a bit of risk with real estate investing, but it's real estate. It's relatively safe and secure. Okay. Uh, Catching the playbacks for a while since I haven't caught the live show. Yeah, good to see you on How to Save. Appreciate that. Almost leaning to, but a newer car at this point. I want to do the Rose Heart Snowball. It's so bad. <laughs> yeah, the Rose Heart Snowball is great. Like a lot of real estate investors take on, it's the burr effectively, right? You buy a property, you renovate the property, you rent the property out for fair market rent. You go back and you refinance the property and you pull out all your renovation budget and then you repeat the process. You make real estate better for the people. That's the most important piece. Um, no one wants, like there's a lot of C and D class units on the market and so you buy up those, those bad units that have you know, the rougher tenants in them, the rougher buildings. You repair them and then you unlock value. It's a great way to make money and you're doing good by the economy as well. You're creating better units. I often will buy properties that are single family and duplex them so I'll go from one unit to two. I'll often add bedrooms and bathrooms. So a property that maybe had one person in it now has two families in it. So you're housing more people. You're creating more affordable housing. This house now is generating more rent for the landlord. That's a win-win scenario where it's good for everyone. So I, I love the Burr, big fan of it. Um, this Rose Heart Real Estate Snowball combines the Burr with intense frugality. It requires you to be so frugal that you're saving pretty much everything you're making and putting that towards real estate every dollar of rental income, you don't spend that, you don't enjoy it, you put it aside and you delay that gratification for a future day and you basically build wealth really fast because that's your focus, right? And so that's the real, Rose Heart Real Estate Snowball, big fan of it. Um, you can always play the shoulda, woulda, coulda game. You've hustled harder and bought more rentals five years ago and had much more money. You have lots more money and yeah, Chuck Norris, that's a, that's a good point. I like the name there. Um, yeah. You can always think back of what you could have done. Um, I have no regrets. I'm so glad I didn't go to law school. Um, delayed gratification is, is such where, I saw that comment just pop up, one marshmallow now or two later. Uh, exactly, that, that's what it is at the end of the day. Most people want their marshmallow now and they should delay their marshmallow now, suffer through and get two, ten, two to 10 marshmallows later. You get up unlimited marshmallows if you delay enough. Most people won't get to that point because they don't know how to delay. But if you delay enough, you literally get infinite marshmallows for life. So that's kind of how it works. The cool thing about compound interest means that eventually you get to a point where you get free marshmallows for life if you just continue to delay. It becomes like a marshmallow tree that produces for life. So that's the beauty of delayed gratification and the power of compound interest. I think that 
it it's like the eighth wonder of the world, as they say, is if you start making good choices now, then they'll compound. And so that's all you can do. But I mentioned the word sacrifice. You guys notice I use the word sacrifice. Sacrifice literally means to go without for something else. That is what sacrifice means. So you need to go without a certain comfort or luxury now to have more later. And so that's, if you look at all of the successful people in history, all of them have embraced sacrifice. Warren Buffett used to walk over his kids reading a book, not even noticing his kids were there. Um, you could pick like pretty much every famous great person has had to make a sacrifice to get to where they are today. Nothing good comes without sacrifice. You want to get to the top of the mountain, you've got to climb it, right? There's, that's just the nature of, of what it is. Um, <laughs> something just jumped in there. Uh, yeah, so that, that's what it is at the end of the day. Do you send a real estate purchase agreement to the seller's agent or do you get your lawyer to? So Snake Eyes 11, um, if I'm doing a private sale, I'll write up the agreement of purchase and sale and it'll be all done and I'll just send it to the lawyer when it's done for them to process the transaction. I don't have my lawyers write up the offers. I don't even have them review them. I will often have the seller take my offer I just wrote that we worked together on to their lawyer to review because they're obviously not professionals, but the process of writing and reviewing offers is not hard. It's very, very simple. Uh, realtors actually don't add, a, or sorry, lawyers don't really add any huge value and the realtor doesn't, and if you're an expert at writing offers, the realtor doesn't necessarily bring any huge value either. Um, where a realtor could bring a ton of value is in the negotiation process, in the relationship process, in uh, you know put, putting together everything I think is, is the key piece. Like if a realtor knows X about the property or how to get the renovation done for a little bit cheaper, they could add some value for the buyer. On the seller side, if they know a buyer, they can connect them, they can add some value. But honestly, you can do real estate transactions without a lawyer, without a lawyer and without a uh, real estate agent. I mean, you need a lawyer to close the transaction itself, but to write the offer. You don't necessarily need a lawyer's intervention at all until like a couple days before closing to grab title and transfer. Um, so yeah, you don't even really need title insurance. Technically, it's, it's become a thing that everyone gets title insurance. But in the old days, you didn't even need title insurance to close a property. Uh, you could kind of take that risk if you wanted to. It was sort of an optional thing. I don't know if today it's still optional, but yeah. Uh, do you believe Burr Snowball investing with just 20K is it possible, or should I wait until I'm somewhere around 40, 50K? How do you put together money to buy your first property out of college? Um, yeah, so you need 20% down payment, ideally, if you don't use private financing. So 20% down payment on a $200,000 house would be about 40 grand. So to get started on the strategy, you need about 40 grand. If you had a full-time job, that might take you six to 12 months to save that up. Um, if you could borrow the money from family to get started or join venture partnership with someone, uh, something I would like to do, one of my um, mentorship goals is to build a mentee fund that would fund and seed the down payments for all my mentees. They would manage the property. They would do all of the active um, work on boots on the ground and I would just be there as a mentor helping them with their properties effectively, and I'd be getting a good return on my money. It's the best place to be. You eventually move up, if you know like the rich dad, poor dad quadrant, you eventually move up to a position where you know you start in the trenches grinding in real estate, maybe it's like 20 or 40 grand, and then eventually you move up to, um, sorry, and then eventually you move up to a point of, my phone just rang there, I canceled the Instagram. Sorry if you guys are still, hopefully you guys are still on there. Um, you eventually get to a point where you can evolve to doing private lending. That's the ultimate, in my opinion, is a stock portfolio and private lending. You don't have to get your hands dirty at all, you don't have to do any work, you simply are coordinating uh, and kind of funding a lot of these deals. So the good deals come to you, you get to invest in those, and you have no day-to-day -day at all. Um, so anyway, let's keep going here. What's a reasonable price for documentation prep fees? Documentation prep fees. So William, I don't know if you're meaning like from a lawyer, um, typically $400, $500 legal fee to close the transaction plus five to $700 in disbursements is very, very typical from a lawyer's perspective. Um, I don't know anyone who just does, a lawyer must review an offer, like they'd review an offer, put it together for probably 500 bucks, maybe a thousand bucks, something like that. But you want to be able to act quickly in a private situation, so I think it makes way more sense to be able to write your own offers. To learn how to do that, it's not very hard. Um, you can walk through a couple of offers and in no time at all, 
um, yeah, at no time at all you get to a point where you'd be at, sorry, my phone keeps ringing here, it's distracting me. Um, you'd get to you get to a point in no time flat where you'd be in good position. Sorry, I'm just reading these comments. So assuming a buy price of 90 to 125,000. So 90 to 125K would mean you'd need just 20% of that amount. So if it was $90,000, you need $18,000 down payment. So then yeah, if you bought a $100,000 property, you could buy about $20,000 down. Uh, $125,000 property would be a little bit more, be about 25, 30,000 down. Depending if you renovate the property, uh, you may need a little more. If you already have a job and you're bringing in some income, you could use that income to kind of cover some of the renovations and help get you there. Or you can use sort of a second mortgage or refinance strategy to get the capital to get the deal done. People put deals together with no money too. Like let's not forget that you don't need 20% down, it's just ideal. You could do 5% down just to get in your first deal. But again, there's gonna be fees associated with buying at 5% down. So it's kind of, you gotta weigh the pros and cons and decide what's best for your, your personal strategy. Wish I could save 40K in 12 months. Taxes are pretty hard on my salary, but thank you for all you do. I've been living a lot frugally since I came across your video. That's awesome, how to say it. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, definitely, frugality is key. Maybe in your case, if your income's low, we need to have, you need to watch some of the videos on how to earn more money. I should do some more videos on strategies to earn money. There are lots of ways to pick up side hustles. Pretty much anyone with a heartbeat and a you know, 100 IQ can make 25 grand a year. There are strategies right now you can go online and you can make thirty dollars an hour online, twenty thirty dollars an hour. There's some online strategies that I can talk about. So there's a lot of side hustles you can make that make forty, fifty grand a year, pretty safely. And the tax rates are not that high. If you make twenty five grand a year, your tax is almost nothing. Um, the government, like your tax, would be like fifteen percent on average. So you'd be paying almost no tax. The poor don't pay any tax. The wealthy pay all the tax to support the whole system, right? It's designed in a progressive system so that the first twelve thousand dollars in income we earn is taxed at zero. After that, it's a little bit more, right? So we're in a system where if you don't earn a lot, the advantage is at least you don't pay a lot of tax, you pay almost nothing. So you'd be a net positive and probably like having a really good after-tax amount of income. So pick up some side hustles, that's, that's key. It's in the middle, 60K before tax. Have you seen the insane appreciation of Windsor? 13.56% this year alone. Yeah, I did see that. London, I thought London had the highest appreciation year like of last year it was london then windsor i think um so we're actually a blessed market for being one of the hottest markets in canada from a year over year or sorry a, um over the whole year appreciation month over month i think windsor's actually a little bit hotter right now um the thing to remember is that if you're buying stuff in london and windsor we might be at a peak we might be getting to an all-time high that's why i think you should buy for cash flow just be careful guys we're going into some of the hottest prices we've seen, be careful in these bidding wars, be careful when you're buying stuff that doesn't cash flow very well. What if the market crashes and we lose $50,000? All we have then is the rental income. That's where we have to make sure we're buying properties that have good cash flow. Be very smart, right? An issue could arise with a, a tenant and next thing you know, you have some maintenance issues and there's no profit at all. And none of us are gonna wanna work, do landlording for free. Like landlording sucks. It's not something we wanna be doing out of the goodness of our hearts. Like no one, it's the worst thing that I do. That's why I outsource it. That's why I have a property management company with people in charge that handle that, right? Because I don't wanna be dealing with that. As you can see in the comments right now, people are watching on my YouTube channel, you can go check it out. There's someone in there right now, an angry tenant in the property we bought that's like going on and on about some bed bugs or something. Bed bugs are a tenant issue. Like I'm just gonna say that straight up. Bed bugs come in from the tenants. Um, all of our units we've treated, you know, we get them treated, but you treat them once and the bed bugs come back again. Because the people go to their friend's house for a sleepover and bring the bed bugs back again. I think there are actually grounds where you can bill, usually it's 50 50, but after uh, there's a landlord tenant board case where um, I know someone who, who did two treatments and the third time it was a thousand dollar treatment, they made the tenant pay it. Because the tenants was the tenants were causing the problem, right? So that's the challenge is, is pinpointing where it's coming from. And, and yeah, um, it's not great. Like, managing tenants and dealing with like the bottom of society that's the worst part of being a landlord they bring their stress and their troubles on you and our job is to provide clean affordable housing i ideally like to target the higher end tenants the tenants that they have a plumbing leak they get a plumber and they fix it they're just embarrassed to call the landlord that's that's the ideal tenants so we strive for that and i think if we're working in the c and d market and trying to improve a property 
bring in good management that's gonna handle the property and transition that through. At the end of the day, if a tenant doesn't wanna be in a property and you don't want them there, you should work together to get them in another unit that's gonna be a better fit. But yeah. Um, did you lie and say your first rental was your primary residence? I've heard of people doing that to avoid land transfer tax and capital gains. Yeah, I've heard of people doing that. My first property that I bought was actually my primary residence, so I didn't, didn't lie. Um, but there are people who, who have done that, I've heard. You can also choose to not use your one-time uh, land transfer tax exemption and just take the, uh, you can you defer it until you buy your first house. So let's say your first property was a $100,000 rental property. You don't wanna waste your land transfer tax credit on a small property. You wanna use it on a bigger property. And so you might, sit, you might just use it as a rental, not live in it, and then buy something and use it down the road. That's my understanding of how you can use it. It doesn't count if you do like a joint venture partnership in a company and then you buy your primary residence later on, you can still use it. That was my understanding, but someone have to fact check that for me. In which case, um, yeah, you want your first property to be one you're claiming to live in. Even if you live in it for a few months, at least you're living in it. Go move into it for a little bit and you know, get your mail there. Okay, have you seen the insane appreciation in Windsor? We did that question. Um, how could a person get rid of bed bugs? Man, it'd be scary to have a bed bug infestation. Yeah, yeah, so there is actually treatment you can get. The problem is it mostly relies on the tenant. So the best treatment you can do for bed bugs is, because my in-laws own a pest control company, I, I've been, I kind of grew up in it, and they're not in this city, but I kind of got to see you know, from a young age kind of how to do it. I've even done them myself, the remediations. It's, it's brutal, brutal work. So you, only, you can kill bed bugs with extreme heat. So if you get like bed bugs on a piece of clothing you can, and you haven't infested your house yet, you can take off the clothing, throw it right in the dryer on high heat for 45 minutes, the bed bugs are dead. So it's easy to actually not like to make sure you don't get bed bugs. If I came from a unit that had bed bugs, I take my shoes off at the door, take all my clothes off down to my underwear, and I throw it right in the dryer and I run it for 45 minutes. That's how if you're working on a, like if I'm renovating or walking into a property that has bed bugs, because sometimes they, they do, it's Pretty much the only properties that I come across that have bed bugs are like the bottom 20% of rental units on the market, pretty much. Um, the higher end properties you typically won't get the bed bugs, and that's not because wealthy people don't get them, it's because if they do get them, they take care of it, and they take the precaution to not have it. Typically, like what makes bed bugs spread like wildfire is messy houses with clothes everywhere, right? Or like, if you, to treat the units properly, all the furniture should come out, and you should spray the units and like there's a whole bunch of precautions you should do and all the furniture goes in the garbage. If you spray and go through all that and the people don't get rid of their furniture, they're not gonna get rid of the bed bugs. So the problem is that the poor people who have the bed bugs infestations can't get rid of it because they don't, can't get rid of all their furniture and their clothes. That's what they should be doing is getting rid of it all, right? Or they have to get a heat treat unit and you put all the furniture inside a heat treat unit, which costs more than the value of the furniture in most cases. So that's the challenge with bed bugs. It's a real problem here in Southwestern Ontario. Like actually, I wanna do a video just on like infestations like uh, cockroaches and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> enough with the bed bugs. Yeah, the tenants are, are, are there's a tenant in the comments here that's, that's going wild. Uh, I don't actually know if they're a tenant of, of ours, I, I don't know, but uh, I'm sure the manager will, will take care of it. We're probably probably already coordinated a, a spray at this point, so it's it's probably something like, yeah, they're, they're not being doing due diligence. Killing it in that American Eagle shirt. So anyway, let's see. Oh my goodness, my phone just keeps ringing here, guys. This is the problem, my phone just keeps ringing. I'm gonna get a, another number just so that people can't call me. This is the worst. Sorry, it's interrupting my stream. I apologize, guys, if it's cutting up the stream. Right now I'm not to be disturbed. Keep calling me. Okay, so I missed a question here. I saw it here, a little joke about the American Eagle shirt. You know what, all my clothes were given as gifts. I don't even. I literally don't buy clothes, um, ever. They just are, they're all gifts that I've had from like forever ago. And most of my t-shirts are like 10 years old, so don't judge my American Eagle 10-year-old t-shirt that I'm rocking. It's still in great condition. I've worn it like a handful of times. Okay, let's see, next question. Are Home Depot contractors a good place, are Home Depot contractors a good place to get contractors? So you mean the Home Depot, um, the Home Depot stores? Yeah, so like if you go to Home Depot or Rona or Lowe's, it can be a great place to find contractors. Um, it's one of those things where, yeah, like I, I've had mixed mixed stuff. Sometimes I've found contractors at Home Depot that were just terrible. Um, 
it makes a lot more sense, I think, to take... I prefer to get my contractors from references. That's my favorite place to get them because they it's someone that's actually done the work. Oh, geez, this must not have been plugged in. Oh, oh there goes that stream. It just died. Facebook's off. Phone died. We're on Instagram and YouTube now. So, where was I? Um, talking about contractors. So, let's see if, what's the best way to get contractors? So you can try Kijiji, you can try Facebook Marketplace, you can try your network, you can try going to like actual construction sites. That's a great place to find good workers is construction sites, especially better, like higher end builder construction sites because the guys there are all vetted most of them are, are like decent caliber. They have good talent, so the builder wouldn't have hired them. So you go somewhere where they're already vetted. At Home Depot, at Lowe's, if you go in the morning, like eight or nine o'clock, you can often find that it's, usually the guys that get up early tend to be the better contractors. They're go-getters. It's not like the lazy guys on, on uh, drugs or whatever that are showing up at Home Depot at like 4 p.m. So it depends when you go, I guess. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You can have good contractors come in there at noon. It's tough to say, like when you're, from Home Depot whether or not you'd find good contractors. I think it's a mixed bag. You could, I guess, talk to the contractor desk and say, hey, is this person in like every day getting materials for jobs? Have you heard good things about them? What sort of jobs are they buying materials for? And that would kind of give you an idea. As a little side note, when I you worked at Home Depot, um, there would be people coming in and they're asking the employees who work there how to do a job literally 15 minutes before they're gonna drive out and do the job and they have no clue what they're doing. That happens a lot, it's true. Um, the DIY mom and pops or the crappy handyman yeah. type contractors will go to Home Depot and ask the guys how to do the job. They'll ask like the store employee who's making like $14 an hour who knows nothing probably or maybe knows not very much about the job how to do the job. You might say those are the people you don't ever want to hire. So you could go there to find people um, who don't, uh, you don't want to hire. Jeez, my phone's blowing up here guys. At what point do you stop sweat equity and just outsource? Um, that's a good point, Austin. I think the best time to outsource is when you feel your time, when you can quantify your time is more valuable than the work that you're doing. So for instance, if like laying floors worth $25 an hour or $20 an hour and your time's worth $40 an hour, it's not worth your time to do that work. That said, there's value in doing some of the work in the beginning to learn the processes and being on site is valuable. I thought for me, at around 15 properties, after I'd done 15 projects, not, I guess there's more than 15 units, but like 15 building projects, I guess, I had like sort of mastered everything I needed to know about like framing and drywalling and, and that. I'm definitely not a master of any of those trades, but I could put in a light fixture, I can fix a faucet, I can lay floors or drywall and that sort of thing. So for me, it's one of those things where I, got diminishing returns. There was no more value for me from, I just wasn't getting value from doing the renovation work anymore. My time was much better spent, um, my time was much better spent on basically finding deals or financing or talking to investors. So you have to decide at a certain point, what is my time best allocated for? I literally refuse to let it, I, I refuse to pick up a hammer. I have people I can call now to do that every time. I will not pick up a drill or a hammer. I make it as a rule of thumb. I do not touch the tools anymore. Even though I can do it, it's not a good use of my time. If I pick up a, a hammer next thing I know, I'll pick up a drill, I'll end up being there all day. So I've decided I do not do that ever. And I had to set that line in the sand because even though I said I was gonna stop, I wouldn't. I would get in the, you know, the contractor would be there putting up a wall. I would just give him a hand, right? We start boarding. Next thing you know, I'd be doing a little bit of plumbing. I'd be there all day and I get none of my paperwork done, none of my deals figured out, um, none of my, you know, all, all these things that I should be doing to build a real estate business. So working on the business, much more important than working in the business. Plus, like, if you're just going to be doing the renovation work and the property management forever, you'll stay small. And like some people might, it's okay to be small. Like there are guys I've met who are 60 years old, who've got like seven for rental properties, you know what I mean? They've got a little like million or $2 million portfolio, it's okay, it's decent making them 50, 70, 80, 90 grand a year. They have a bit of autonomy, but they're working in their business and that's okay, they've stayed small. If your goal is to scale, Austin, which I think it is, 
Um, I feel like that's your goal, you know, you being a, a mentee, I, I've got that kind of vibe from you. I think that it would make sense for you to outsource, especially on the skill set. Like in your situation, does it make sense for you to be building sweat equity when I, I can I don't want to send insults, but imagine you're just getting started in this journey and you're at a point where your time's already decently valuable and you could be putting deal, deals together, getting financing or things like that, and you could be working on a renovation site and your skills are maybe not very good at all. Imagine you're worth less than minimum wage. There are a lot of construction laborers who are worth less than minimum wage. I've had guys work on sites, create negative value. They did more damage on the site than value they provided. They weren't even worth minimum wage to me. So you could th theoretically be on site and have no skills and actually do more damage to your project being on site. Like you trying to do the flooring yourself and then screwing it up, or you like trying to do electrical yourself and bring your house down or like plumbing and then having, imagine you plumb your own sink Austin and then like two months from now it leaks everywhere because you didn't know what you're doing. Now you've created your, your, your four or five, six hours you have to drive back and fix that issue, et cetera, troubleshoot it. And maybe you had to hire a plumber anyway. We're doing better to outsource from day one. So I think the outsourcing decision comes down to your skills, the current value of your time, and a whole bunch of other factors, more than I could cover, even in this like little five minute segment here. But uh, yeah, I guess in your situation, probably makes sense to outsource. In my situation, I have the skills, I could do it, but my time is better spent doing other things, right? Providing value in a meaningful way. When owning a rental property, is it okay to have people do the work for you when you need it done? Major stuff mostly. Zach? Yeah, definitely, Zach. Um, 100%, it, most people do outsource. Most people do not, um, you know, most people do not grab the, you know, pick up the hammer and do all the work themselves. There are some, like, really skilled contractors who can do that and who, you know, can do A to Z and, and that makes sense, but I think most people don't. Oh my God, my phone keeps ringing. It's like, this is not priority I'm live streaming right now guys I'm gonna wrap this up pretty soon I guess there's a couple fires I got to put out seems like as a real estate investor most of what I do is jump from fire to fire to fire 14 hours a day that's that's the real life you want to see actually into the life of my gross heart I'm on this thing this phone rings all day I get hundreds of texts a day if you text me in the morning I'd have to scroll for days to find the text from you even if I wanted to respond to it I probably have lost it I go on Instagram and I got a dozen dozens of messages and that's the real life of a real estate investor. I might make it sound glamorous and great, but in truth, it's a lot of grinding, guys. And I wake up in the morning to 20 or 30 text messages. I try to respond to all of them. Then more problems happen. My phone rings like crazy. That's, that's being a real estate investor. Even if you're not doing the work, you're coordinating all the people to get the things done. And balls are gonna be dropped. That's part of like building a, building a successful business. You have to learn through trial and error and through failure, but yeah, it's not, sexy people are thinking like passive income at some point i will shift to a strategy where and i'm already getting there like we already have a crew that's fairly large um we have like 15 20 people that are pretty much always working for us if i get to a place where we have 50 or 100 people working in our network i mean just the the hr issues to try to manage all of those people that's f like 60 hours a week i could never even solve the problems i have to rely on the people in my company to solve the issues, right? The project manager has to manage the general site super, who has to manage the guys working on site, who has to manage the laborers, right? There's such a chain of command. I couldn't even, we have so many renovation sites right now, I couldn't even go to all of them in one day. I couldn't even spend an hour at each site. That's how many things we have going on right now. That's like, as you scale, you have to outsource. And so that's just the nature and the evolution of, of all of this. So um, yeah, a lot going on. And this is, this is the sobering reality of, of all of this and some people might say like Mike you've got enough money why don't you just sell everything put in a stock portfolio and collect dividends and enjoy life um, some days that's really tempting but I think at my core of who I am not working as hard as I am now but somewhere in the middle I, I enjoy the growth I enjoy mentoring people and sharing and, and watching people transform their lives like there's nothing more satisfying to me than watching someone go from you know like one property to ten properties or watching you guys go from like uh, no savings rate and in debt to saving 30, 40, 50% of your income or watching you go from 25,000 in income to 50,000. That, that's amazing. What I don't love is when I tell people, this happens a lot, people reach out for advice, I give them my advice and they take no action and nothing happens. That's, that's frustrating, that's a waste of time. Um, yeah, that's, I'm gonna stop my venting now. I really gotta deal with this call, there's some stuff going on here, I don't know. Something with the real estate deal that's going down. I'm also a realtor, guys, so let's not forget that I also have 
some listings. And I think there's a couple offers coming in. That's why people keep calling me. So I'm going to deal with that in just a sec. So what is the sequence of trade man when you start with renovations? So what is the sequence? You would bring in a contractor to do the work. They would quote the work. You give them a scope of work. You draw a floor plan. You list out what you want them to do. And then they would coordinate all of that, bring in the appropriate subtrades, or they would do the work themselves. The work would get finished. Then you could rent the property out. That's typically uh, what happens here. Okay, I'm gonna go up here and try to answer the rest of these questions and then I'm gonna peace and deal with some real estate deals and go make myself 10 or 20 grand, do some high value stuff. This is something that's been hard for me too, is like I'll get dragged into like the minutia and I'll micromanage. Like my, my nature is perfectionist and micromanager. The problem is, and I know those are my weaknesses, right? I just told everyone in the, on the internet my, my weaknesses. But what perfection, what I have to do is step back and say, hey, eight out of 10 is enough and trust the people in your company. They're gonna make mistakes. They're gonna drop the ball sometimes. But in order to grow, I literally can't micromanage every site. I literally can't micromanage every process. I have to learn to train, systematize, and bring in the right people and outsource the work. And so that's something I've been kind of learning on. Uh, okay. We're trying to gain knowledge here. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I, I should, I'll just ban this, this person from my channel. We don't need this kind of negativity in the chat. I'm sure that uh, if you reach out to the property manager, we have two of them, reach out to them and they'll, they'll coordinate. If they've already coordinated a spray um, and you have bed bugs again after the spray, it's you have to pay. We're not going to pay for multiple bed bug treatments. The first one costs 500, we're not gonna do another one. So anyway, that's my last of me addressing that. I'm not going to address it again on this live stream. This is what happens as you build a public persona. If I had any people that I owed money to, you can imagine they would jump on. This is how you know that I'm a credible borrower because I have a very, very public figure, right? I got lots of DMs. So people would tag me on Instagram and Facebook. I wasn't paying debts. I always pay my debts. And so I like having a public profile when I lend to people too because people who have public profiles, they can't hide. They have to pay their debts. They have to um, be forthcoming and, and honest and that sort of thing. So that's a nice thing about social media that I really like, especially people that are posting daily. So when I look to lend out, to my mentee fund, I want to see my mentees posting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Jonas is behind me, one of my mentees here. I know a second cell phone line is not being frugal, but I normally don't answer my personal cell phone from numbers I don't know. This is why I want a different cell phone number. Thanks, D's information, good point. We actually have, so I'm live on Instagram, this is our company phone right here. Um, most people have this number, Somehow a bunch of people keep getting this number. I don't know if like property managers or contractors or it's on the internet as because I'm a realtor. They found my personal number and they don't call the company phone. This, com this phone I put down at night, but people keep finding my personal number and I'm not gonna change it because I've got literally thousands of contacts on my phone. It's going through my phone. I have like a dozen electricians, dozen plumbers. I have like a dozen of every trade in my phone. I didn't even realize I had so many connections over the years. So it's wild how much value has been built just on a phone in intellectual you know, property and whatnot. Why not pay, oh, I lost the question. Um, okay, I lost the question here. Why not pay full price for labor and materials? Use a general contractor so you can buy faster. Snake Eyes 11, great point. If I could find a good construction company that priced reasonably, I would just outsource entirely and not insource the construction at all. Uh, I right now have a great crew of guys and I could never let them go. I, I, I rely on them as well as what I was finding when I was outsourcing was these contractors, the you know, medium sized and bigger ones that can handle our volume, they take on seven projects and they dink around on all seven projects. The timelines go way out, the budgets go way over. I had no control. And being the perfectionist and control freak that I am, until I can find someone who does at least an eight out of 10 as good a job as we can do with a similar cost, I'm not willing to outsource. Um, management, stay tuned. We're, we're working on something with that. Uh, right now. Doesn't the listing agent have an incentive to list the house for as little as possible? So listing agent, why would they have a, an incentive to list it for as little as possible? I guess the listing agent wants, they get to pay commission. So their goal would be to sell it for as much as possible. Because every extra, let's say, if you get an extra hundred grand for the house, that's an extra two, three thousand dollars in commission. So they'd be, they're actually incentivized to get as much as they possibly can for the house. They make more money. But I could see how they'd be incentivized to say, sell it faster. 
a listing agent would want to like every agent would want to sell a property fast. I think anyone should want to sell their property. Like any seller should want to sell their property fast. Holding costs will kill you, and stale properties sell for less. If a property doesn't sell in its first three weeks, typically it sells for less than ask. So what that means is you want to sell your property quickly. The listing agent wants to price it just right, not price low, but price just right so it sells quickly for the most they can possibly get. The listing agent has a fiduciary duty to represent the client and get as much as they possibly can. So as a realtor, I try to get as much as I possibly can for my listings. At the same time, you also don't want to screw the buyer over because you know they, your name would get around as somebody who oversells overpriced listings. You don't want it, it's a happy medium. On private deals, I try to get the best deal that we possibly can by offering other things like moving services or other auxiliary services like finding them a new place to live or a new property, often trading trading titles, things like that. Hey Mike, I've been on the grind lately and haven't had time to catch the stream. 16 hours a day, building my business and working on my house. Any luck finding students for Limber Loss? That's a good question. I should ask the management division. That'd be a question for um, Wei and Joe and Abe and Alan. Those guys are handling they may have, I know they're doing some showings on that one. It's a tough time, like to find students in July is very difficult. The students start in September, right? So most of them will come in August and we'll find students that way for the September 1st deadline. If you miss the boat, you know, the May 1st deadline is ideal and you get 12 month lease, but otherwise you hit the September bandwagon. You can often get a little bit of a premium if you can agree to an eight month lease. So something we can think about. I actually don't know, I have to check in with the management division. Again, I can't run everything. It's impossible for me to run our, we have like 300 bedrooms or like 120 units or something right now. We're working on a new system that's gonna fix everything and not fix everything, but definitely make things better and move in the right direction from a management perspective. So I'm really excited about what's coming. So stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, thanks for jumping in. Good to see you on the live stream. Okay, do you bring contractors through a property before you buy it? How does that work? Uh, yeah, usually I'll take a video and I'll send the video to the contractor and then I'll walk the contractor in once we bought the property or before I'll put in the right to show the property to prospective contractors to get quotes and you get quotes and then when the, you know, the project closes, hopefully you can get in there with your contractors. In London, Ontario, it's one of the hottest markets in Canada right now and it's been such for so long. We have the most housing starts, I think, per capita, like right now, we have a lot. I don't know if it's the most per capita, but we have a lot in London right now. What that means is the supply, the demand for trades is super high and the supply is super low. So to find good guys at a reasonable cost, very hard to do. You can find guys who are good, like 40 bucks an hour, but like you don't wanna pay that ideally for their, you know, unless they're really, really good or a specialized skill trade, right? So it's sort of, you wanna find like decent guys at a decent price and when the demand is super high, that's really, really hard to do. I appreciate the time, Mike, thanks. No problem. How do you get clients as a real estate agent? These information, um, Again, I've not been I've not been doing a ton of prospecting, but they kind of just come to me. People want to buy real estate, and they know that I know how to buy investment properties. That's been my specialty for a long time. I know what to look for in a property, and so that's kind of helped me as a positioned expert in market. People come to me, listings. People want me to sell their house because they know I have a list of buyers who are interested, and then people want to buy investment properties um, you know, with me because they know I know what to look for. So that's how been how I get clients. I think positioning yourself as an expert is key. If you're going to focus on investment properties. Focus on that. Don't focus on selling like family houses. You need to brand and, and niche down, I think, to become an expert. And then once you're an expert, people will come to you and trust you. Okay. Let's see. Hey Mike, I have a property on my radar selling for 625K. I have 40K and I need 116K more for 25% down payment. Any thoughts on how to raise that cash? Definitely difficult. I would go on, here's the thing, go on Craigslist or go on, go on Kijiji and type in private lender, 100 will pop up. If you go call all 100 of those people and you explain to them you have a deal, it's under market, great opportunity and you need the cash, someone will come to the table. It might cost you 10, 12, 14 points. I guarantee you someone will come to the table. I've done that and I got financing on a deal doing that when I was a no one. So you go around, you call 100 people and you'll get it 100%. If you put the time in, you make the calls, you will get the results. Same with deals. If you go knock on a thousand doors and you call up a hundred real estate agents and you call up 10 wholesalers in town, I guarantee you're gonna get a deal. It's, you put in the time, you get the result. Okay, uh, first thumbs up, <laughs> nice. How do you title search yourself? I don't, 
Um, I can go on like I'm a realtor, so I can go on my matrix back end. I can see who's owned the property and who owns the properties. I can go on Geo Warehouse and also see like sale history and stuff. So I have both of those at my disposal to kind of see comps and, and things like that. You you can't really do it. Um, oh jeez, disconnected from the thing here. Oh no, I lost my live stream too. Instagram's gone too, and there's no playback. Okay, I'm ending this. I've lost Facebook and Instagram now. The only place they can watch is YouTube now. So let's end this stream. It's, it's been going on long enough, and my technology is failing on all devices. Property's 13 units, rental income's 55K. So just shop that around. Someone will guarantee, you'll guarantee be able to send, put the deal together. If you call enough people, you make enough calls to investors to get it done. Uh, did you have a truck when you were renovating your own properties? No, I did it all in a Ford Focus. If I can do it in a car and I can haul lumber in a car and get the heavy stuff delivered, you can too. So vehicle is not necessarily an excuse. Why don't you buy really cheap homes? They have better ROI on average. Um, it's not necessarily true. It just depends. Uh, there's no like guaranteed. I think at the really low end price point, like a $100,000 house, you get issues with um, sometimes there's like major structural issues or on the really cheap houses you'll find the cost of utilities is much higher. Like say a $50 connection fee, for instance, on your like hydro, and the $50 connection fee on your gas bill, there's like connection fees that exist. That $100 a month, if your rent on a $100,000 house is 1% rule, $1,000 a month, 10% of your cost right there is connection fees. If your house is a $300,000 house, the connection fee is the same. That's 3% of your rent is spent on connection fees. So the cost, imagine a roof. You put a roof on a small house, it's like seven grand. Roof on a big house is like fourteen grand. But fourteen grand over a three hundred thousand dollar house is a much smaller expense than say seven grand even on a hundred thousand dollar house. Right? So the smaller houses, the big repairs, they crush you. So that's where you have to be careful with the really, really low cost houses, is there's not a ton of like margin there. Um, it's less than you might think. The profit margins aren't as good. And what if you renovate a property and can't get it rented? Therefore, you can't get the refinance. So you don't need to have it rented to get the refinance. You can just go back and get an appraisal. You can do a burr without renting it out. Um, the renting is nice because you have cash flow and that covers all your expenses. It's the ideal way to burr, but it's also possible to just go and get you know the comps reappraised. There's three ways to value a property, right? There's appraisals, so you get comps. Or sorry, there's a, in an appraisal, there's comps, so comparable properties. This is the number one way that they appraise properties. It requires you not to have it rented. Uh, the second way is the income approach, which would require you to rent it out and have an income, but they can do a schedule A that says this is what the market rent is. And so you get basically, now you've renovated it, you get a higher market rent, and they can appraise it based on that. Or C, using the cost approach. So that's why we give all the data that we do. Anyway, I see 120K homes in Windsor being rented for 1200 to 1400 consistently. Is this a typical? No, it seems pretty normal. But then the profit wouldn't be near as good as say a $300,000 house that was 1%. So a $100,000 house at 1% rule is totally different than a $300,000 house at 1% rule. A $300,000 house at 1% rule has way more cash flow as a percentage and raw cash flow than a $100,000 house because the fixed costs are dragged over a smaller asset and a smaller rent base. So something to think about. Um, anyway, my favorite, I'm just gonna mess with, my favorite thing to do is talk to the tenants and work it out with them to allow you to, to renovate effectively, right? So when you're getting into the burst strategy, at the end of the day, the hardest part is the human element. And so getting good property management is key to getting, getting through things. But anyway, um, yeah, what's a good ROI for a noob? Uh, 10 to 25% I think is good for a noob. Um, it's better than the stock market. It's safer, you get some appreciation too. I like 25%, that's always been like my a rule of thumb but yeah I mean getting into a deal and making some money is better than not getting into a deal at all right anyway I'm gonna wrap this stream up thank you guys so much for tuning in unfortunately the Instagram will not be live for playback and Facebook will probably not be live for playback because they both died but uh, you'll have the YouTube to check out and food for thought I'm throwing this out there I may stop doing the live stream just because it's a lot to do every single Wednesday and start doing, you guys submit questions to me by Instagram or ideally by email, 
I compile the questions and I do segments based on groups of questions. So if there's a bunch of financing questions, I'll do a show on financing. A bunch of questions on like how to evict tenants to get the maximum ROI, I'll do a video on, on how you work with tenants to get them out, right? Especially the bad tenants that you don't want in your properties, right? Um, funny, I'll share a little story. We had a crack addict actually at one of our properties um, squatting and we sent the police there to drag them off the property today. Man, I wish we had work camps again for the lowest of society to start generating some real value. London's bad in, in some of the east areas for crack addicts, just as a random aside. The things you deal with as a landlord, the things you deal with. Yeah, anyway, so if you guys think that's a good idea, I'd like to hear about it in the comments and shoot me a message. I think I'm gonna move towards that format at some point and maybe go live on Instagram and Facebook and maybe the occasional YouTube, but not on a consistent basis. Maybe I'll go, here's an idea, just thought it from the spot. Maybe I'll film it live, but I'll do rehearsed questions you guys have sent in. So then I can filter and say, this is just on financing. And I won't look at the live chat other than just like say hi to the guys, you know, at the end of the show or whatever, or the beginning of the show. But once I start the video, I'd like, you'll be behind the scenes watching me film a real segment for my main channel. And I'll do like financing questions or like I don't know, deal questions or whatever. And we'll do certain types of questions. Um, cool. So I'm going to end the stream. Uh, William says you made it when you have a hater in your live stream. That time I look at week. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Um, anyway, yeah, that tenant who reached out, that kind of soured my stream. That was nasty. Um, I hope they reach out to the property management company, and if they haven't already had uh, bed bug sprays, I hope they get another spray coordinated. Uh, if they want to, they should just pay for it. I mean, if we've already sprayed once and the bed bugs have come back, it's 100% their fault they need to pay for it. Maybe we'll be willing to compromise. I'll talk to the property manager and see the situation. Maybe we'll pay half. Um, but, you know, people who have no money don't get things. Anyway, bye guys.